No, I'm just starting. It's definitely not over. Is that all right with you guys? Well, thank you, kids. This was, uh, this was quite the week. In fact, I got to be honest, parents and, and Vintage Grace families, this was definitely one of the highlights of, of my summer so far was watching these kids as they pursue Jesus on this journey. In fact, it was such a highlight that I actually changed the sermon for this Sunday because I came in here on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and watched these kids and felt that, did you guys feel the energy? Could you not feel the energy? Like, are you awake? And I got to see these kids on one level pursue a journey with Jesus. Now, they might not know what they're pursuing. We, we say that we're all pursuing something. We say it's our joy. Every single one of us this morning is pursuing our joy. We're pursuing what's going to make us happy. And part of our desire for our kids' ministry program is to give them opportunities to wrestle with what is it that brings me joy. You see, our goal of this week at VBS, we don't call it VBS, we call it Base Camp, um, because I like acronyms, right? So Bible, art, sports, explorations, but we just don't believe that vacation and school should ever be in the same sentence. <laughs> but we call it Base Camp, and the aim for us as a church is to give these kids opportunities to begin their journey with Jesus. And the goal was not to get them to like raise their hand and say some prayer at the end. Because we've been talking about this all summer, right, church? That prayers are not what saves us. It's a life of trusting and treasuring Christ. We're not anti-prayers. We're big fans. But there's no magic words that we can say or get these kids to say that will help them. We're trying to give them opportunities to experience God, to enjoy God. So as I'm wrestling with that this, this whole week, and I'm watching these kids, I'm watching our leaders do an incredible job. If you see someone in a blue or a neon shirt, make sure you say thank you. If you see someone with pink hair, that's Lexi, or big hair, that's Howie. Uh, you guys know him as Michael and Lexi, but tell them thank you for pointing our kids towards Jesus, towards helping them encourage him. And I thought it'd be good for us as a church to almost take a break. So I decided to take a break from our Desiring God series. We'll jump into that next week, and we'll continue that on throughout the summer. But I wanted to stop and actually think about what does it look like for us to go on a journey and climb the mountain of faith? Because I think sometimes, how many of you guys wish you'd go back to VBS? Anybody? When times were simpler? When you're like, where's my snack time? Anyone miss nap time? That was the highlight of kindergarten. You know, where it's like, oh, I just, I just want to rest. But I want to think about what does it look like to climb the mountain of faith? Or, or the way that we talk about it here is what, it look, what does it look like, and they just sang about it, to journey with Jesus. And we're going to look at a guy by the name of Peter. Now, part of why I love Peter is Peter's just a normal guy like the rest of us. He's a fisherman by trade. He's this guy that, that got introduced to Jesus, and he got to decide at some point in his life, am I going to journey with Jesus? Am I going to follow him? Am I going to trust him and treasure him and go after what Jesus is actually offering? And I think that's the most important question that any of us could ever answer in life. It determines how much joy we're going to get, not just in the next life, but in this life right here. So we're going to look at the life of Peter, an ordinary fisherman by trade. If you have your Bibles, pull them out to Luke chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, Michael and Michael are walking around with Bibles right now, and they'd love to pass one out. Just raise your hand. We've got some church Bibles we'd love to provide for you. I'm on page 734 and 35 in our church Bibles. Because Luke, who's authoring this gospel, Luke's going to give us a snapshot of the life of Peter and the journey we all take if we're to authentically enjoy Jesus. Not because we should, not because we ought to, not because we're supposed to, not because we got drug here, but because we've been invited by Jesus to be in relationship with him. Now, when I think of journeying with Jesus, I'm afraid that many of us think of it kind of weird. Maybe you haven't been to church in a long time, maybe you've been at Vintage Grace in a long time, and, and you're wrestling with what does it look like when the pastor says journey with Jesus. I, I need a volunteer. Can I get a volunteer to be Jesus for me? Bald man beard, that's close. I think Jesus had long hair. Um... But he had a beard, right? And in our paintings, he usually has a sheep wrapped around his shoulders, and he looks way too white because he probably wasn't white, and by probably, I mean he wasn't. But here's my fear when we think about journeying with Jesus. Jesus, would you come here for me? Oh, wow. <laughs> He's even taller than I thought. I think what happens when we have Jesus is that often we think of our journey with Jesus and we're living our life and Jesus is here and we're like, Jesus is my homeboy and we got our trucker hat and we're kind of living our life and we go on this journey and we get to points in our life where we hit a metaphorical wall or maybe there's a tree and I'm like, I need Jesus. You have this point where you realize you can't do it on your own, you can't do it at all and you're like, Jesus, come here, will you help me? Come here, Jesus. You're so good and handsome. I can't get that. Will you get that for me? Awesome. I really wanted to go to Pete's this morning. I got a gift card. Thanks. I'm good. I'm done with you now, Jesus. 
And then we kind of continue our journey. And Jesus is no more than a vending machine. He's no more than when I need something, then I say, Jesus, can you help me again? And then he comes back. And this is what our journey with Jesus is like. This is my fear of how we instruct our kids. Jesus is no more than just a magic genie or, or a, a bearded white man with a lamb around his shoulders. And he's so much more than that. But I think often we think about our journey with Jesus, we need to reconcile who is Jesus? Who do we say that he is? And that's the answer that Peter's going to help us answer. Th thank you, Jesus. Here's a gift card. Take a seat. Give, give Jesus a round of applause. So we're going to look at the story of this man named Peter and how he started his journey with Jesus. Not just for our kids' sake, but for our sake. How we answer the simple question of who do we say Jesus is. Now, you know every story actually has a backstory. Like when you pick up a story in Luke chapter 5, which is where we're going to go this morning, there's stuff that happened before then. In fact, the way that Peter first got introduced to Jesus was actually by his brother, a really good, young, bald man by the name of Andrew. At least that's how I see Andrew in the Bible. And Andrew was experiencing Jesus and journeying with Jesus, so he said, brother, you've got to come figure out who Jesus is. Andrew first invited Peter, and Peter was following around Jesus. Jesus was doing teachings, and he was traveling from different cities, and people were following because they heard about this man that was doing miracles and preaching the gospel. And we're going to kind of define the gospel for us later this morning, but people were following, and Peter was one of those followers at this point in his life. Peter was trying to figure out who is Jesus, who does he say that he is. So we're going to go all the way back to Luke chapter 4, and that's where we're going to start. In Luke chapter 4, it says this, verse 38. At this point, Jesus is on the scene. In fact, Luke is the author of this account. Luke, at the beginning of this gospel, chapter 1, verse 4, he says this, I write these things to you, Theophilus, who was this wise man, maybe a doctor, something like that, a, a patron, and Luke has been commissioned by Theophilus to write this account, to write this gospel, so that Theophilus, here's what verse 4 says, chapter 1, so that you might be certain of the things you've seen and heard about Jesus. You guys heard about Jesus? Anyone here not heard about Jesus? Now, what we've heard about Jesus is a whole other question, but we, we usually have some sort of a construct in America of Jesus. So Luke is writing this letter to say, Theophilus, I want you to be confident, because all you've heard right now is miracles and things of this nature. I want you to be confident of who Jesus is. So Peter's asking that same exact question. Chapter 4, it says this, and he, Jesus, arose and he left the synagogue. This is chapter 4, verse 38. Jesus has been teaching. He started in Nazareth, which was his hometown. That's when he started his teaching ministry. He got rejected at Nazareth. He got kicked out of his hometown. And then we get down to 38, and he continued on teaching. So he went to Galilee, which was about all the way to Capernaum, next to the Sea of Galilee. And they were amazed at what he was teaching. They said to one another, with what word is he doing this? With what authority and power is he teaching? So he leaves the synagogue where he just was, where he was teaching, where he was preaching. And as he's teaching and preaching, people are amazed. They can't believe it. They're absolutely amazed. I mean, it was pretty cool for me this morning. At the end of that song, I've never been clapped for when I got up to preach. That was special. Thank you, church. See, people don't go like, oh my gosh, I'm amazed at Drew's teaching. They're amazed at Jesus' teaching. And I want to know why. It's not the, the style of his teaching and his preaching. It's not because he used lights and lasers or there was a fog machine or, or there were all these things. In fact, Jesus probably taught the same way that any other rabbi taught in that day. He probably sat on a stool and he sat down and he just talked. But here's the difference. It wasn't his style. It was the substance of his message. When Jesus taught, he didn't teach like a student. You know, part of the reason I love to preach is when I get to preach, I get to preach as a student. I go to the word, I study, I pray. I say, God, what did, what did Paul mean or, or what did Luke mean or what did you mean, Jesus, when you said these words? When Jesus taught, he never taught as a student. You know how Jesus taught? He taught as the author because Jesus is God. So people are amazed at his teaching because when Jesus taught, there was power. There was authority. And I'm not saying other preachers can't have that, but they can't have it like Jesus has it. Are we clear? So when Jesus teaches, people are amazed, they're overwhelmed. This demon gets up in the synagogue and says, ah, he tries to distract Jesus. You ever been distracted during a sermon before? Been yelled at? It was my first sermon ever. It happened to me. Someone comes in and yells at you, and you're like, what do I do? It didn't bother Jesus. He's kept teaching, and then he cast the demon out. And everyone's like, oh my gosh, they're amazed. He's teaching, they're amazed. He does miracles, they're amazed. Verse 38, he arose and he left the synagogue with people amazed. 
And he enters Simon, which is another name for Peter, same person. He enters Peter's house. And now Simon's Peter, Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever. And they, and I think they is Peter. Peter appeals to him on her behalf. Now, I don't know how your relationship with your mother-in-law. Mine's here today. So I'm going to be very careful. (laughs) But here's this guy. His mother-in-law is in his house and she's really sick. And he says, I don't want her to die. He appeals to Jesus on her behalf, and he simply says this, Jesus, heal her. Heal my mother-in-law. What does Jesus do? Verse 39, he stood over and he rebuked the fever. Now, rebuke, I think there's all sorts of different ways we can look at the word rebuke. I think of rebuke in honor of my mother-in-law like a little short Italian woman because of power and authority. Now, my mother-in-law is like five foot two, and that's probably generous, right? You love it. And, and when I was dating my wife and pursuing her for marriage, I got to know my mother-in-law, and I learned something about a five-foot Italian woman's rebuke. Because I think they come in different various phases. I call them four different fingers. One finger just simply meant this. It meant, hey, be careful now. You know, you started to talk about the giants in a way that's inappropriate. Two fingers is, okay, now you thought you were funny? You better be careful because you're talking about my daughter now, and that's not Okay. Three fingers was a whole other story. But if you got to four fingers, because when she talks at you, it matters how many fingers are out. (laughs) So Jesus is sitting here, and Peter comes and says, please save my mother-in-law. And I don't know how long it takes Jesus to rebuke, but I think it's pretty quick. It might have not even taken four fingers. He's like, done. Here's what happens. And it left her, and immediately she rose and she began to serve them like a faithful mother-in-law. This woman was on deathbed, she was sick. Jesus rebukes, and she's healed. And she gets up and her life's changed. So Peter's experiencing all of this at his house. This is all before chapter five, and now when the sun was setting, all of those who had any who were sick, so here's Peter, he's at his house. This is a small town, think El Dorado Hills. And word gets out that Jesus is here and that he's healing people. And then anyone, you see that word right there? Any who were sick with various diseases, they brought that to him. They showed up. Now, at this point in Jesus' day, he's traveled about 40 miles, probably not in the same day, but he's tired. He's gone to the synagogue. He's preached the sermon. Most of you guys don't have to see me at one o'clock in the afternoon after I preach. It's better that you don't. He's preached the sermon. He's had people yell at him during his sermon. He's cast out demons. He said, okay, I'm going to retreat. I'm going to leave this thing. I'm going to go to this house of a guy that is kind of following me, trying to figure out who I am. And he comes to the house, and he does another miracle. Now, again, I don't know how much energy miracle takes. I just know for me, I can't put my pants on without being tired. So Jesus is, is he's fully God, fully man. He's a little tired at this point. He heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law. I think at this point, it's the end of the day, the sun's setting. Jesus is ready to leave, and he opens the door, and guess what he sees? Tons of people. How many? We don't know. A couple hundred? Maybe this many? Maybe they're overflow on the patio? Is the patio alive today? Is it too hot? Okay, there they are. I don't know how many people are there. All I know is Jesus walks out the front door and there's a ton of people. Now at this point, what do I do if I'm Jesus? I'm tired, I'm cranky. I'm not Jesus, you understand this. I don't think Jesus is those things, but I think he's really tired. He's fully man. It's been a long day. And here's what Jesus does. Anyone who is there, with he brought them to him and he goes and he lays hands on each and every one. You're healed. 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 Good to see you this morning. Now, if I'm Jesus, how much work does it take me to heal people? Because I'm fully God. Do I need to touch everybody? No. I open the door, I look outside, I see lots of people, and I say, here's the good news, people, you're all healed. I'm going to bed. (laughs) It's not what Jesus does. He takes the time because he cares for every individual and he lays hands on each and every one. He needs them to understand the authority that he has. Now, who's watching this? Who has a front row view of this interaction? Peter. Peter's watching this all unfold and he heals them and demons come out of them crying, you are the son of God. And he says, I'm gonna rebuke you too. The time's not right for everyone to know that I'm the son of God. They need to hear it from me, not from you. You don't have authority. You have no credibility. 
So he rebukes the demons. He says, look, you really don't believe. You know I'm the son of God, but you don't have faith. You've not dropped everything and started serving and following me. You're still creating havoc. He rebukes them, even though they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, so I don't know how long it took to heal everybody, but sunset, door opens, lots of people, and now what time is it? It's day. He took time to be with people in their moment of need at every single opportunity to sit with them, to lay hands on them. And when it was day, he departed and he went to a desolate place and the people sought after him. Now that word sought, I really kind of view it like how my kids, if I leave early in the morning and, and they know I'm leaving, maybe I'm gonna be gone for a couple of days, they jump on my leg, right? You guys ever experienced that as a parent? Where the kid wraps his leg around your leg and then you're dragging him? They sought Jesus. They ran after him. They went for him because they would have kept him from leaving. But he said to them, children, you don't get it. I'm not the Jesus that exists so that you can reach the things that are inaccessible. I'm not the Jesus that does miracles to take away your pain. I'm the Jesus that came to preach the good news. That's who I am. So he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. He left. Because here's the reality for us all this morning. Who we say Jesus is, is probably the most important question that we can ever answer. And Jesus talks in Matthew chapter 7, he says the road is narrow. And what he means by that is this, there's a lot of people that don't get it. They don't get who Jesus is. I think just in the beginning chapters of Luke, we saw Nazareth, which was earlier in chapter 4, where Jesus is originally preaching and they miss it. It's his hometown. If anyone should have gotten who Jesus was, it wasn't the people that watched him grow up when he was teaching as a 12-year-old, when he was doing things that didn't make sense. Wouldn't it have been them? They missed it. In fact, not only did they miss it, they wanted him to do miracles. He's like, it's not about the miracles. It's about who I am. And since he wouldn't do miracles, they said they were going to kill him. And then ironically, he does a miracle to escape their pursuit of him, which they missed. See, Nazareth missed it. I think Capernaum, which is what we just read about, I think Capernaum misses it. They accept the miracles of Jesus, but then they want him to stay because they think he's a vending machine. Because they think that he exists for their alleviation of pain and of suffering. And they miss who Jesus really was. I think the demons actually miss it. They get that he's the Christ. Twice the demons say, you're the Lord, but they don't leave and serve and follow and pursue Jesus. The road is narrow, Jesus says. It's the most important thing that we can ask ourselves is who do we actually say that Jesus is? But I don't think everybody misses it. I think Simon's mother-in-law gets it. I think it's significant that in this Jewish male-centered culture that Luke makes a point to say, she, the woman, got it before anybody else. That's why I love my mother-in-law. That's why we understand that faith comes from all sorts of different kinds and all sorts of different types of people. And then I think Peter gets it. And that's the question for us this morning is does our journey look like Peter's journey? I think there's seven things in Peter's journey in Luke chapter 5 that we're going to look at this morning that will show us that he didn't miss it. And they're all things that I don't care if you've been in the church for 40 years, if you've been here for four minutes. We must figure out who Jesus is. Father God, help us. As we look at Luke chapter 5, Jesus, I pray that you show us who you are, that you're everything you say you are as these kids experience you this week. I pray that we experience you right now. Jesus, we, we know you're here. We're in your presence, so speak to us, speak through me, and may we see you and may we respond accordingly for your glory, for our joy, and for the good of people who don't yet know who you are. We ask these things. And all those people said, Amen. So we're going to walk through chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. We're going to do it pretty quickly. Looking at the life of Peter, when he actually says, I, I know who Jesus is. Here's what it says. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him, that's how good of a preacher this boy was. They're pressing in. It's crowded. Peter's there. This is just after he left the, mother in, the, the house of Peter, healing the mother-in-law and healing the masses. And they're coming around, and they're coming in to hear the word of God. Literally, the voice of Jesus. Not just the word, but his words. They're coming in to hear the word of God, and he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, which is the same as the Sea of Galilee. Kind of like us. We've got a lake in our backyard. Now it's a puddle. So we're sitting out there. Everyone's coming together. It's an all-county church service, and everyone's pressing in. It's crowded because we hear that Jesus is there. So this is the context. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them because it was a five-mile-an-hour zone now. 
and they were washing their nets. Here's the reality, because they were defeated. They went fishing. They didn't catch anything, so they were washing their nets. They called it a day. They packed it in. Getting into the boats, which was Simon's, oh, I'm sorry, and he saw two boats out, and they were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, Peter's, he, Jesus, asked them to put out a little bit from land, and he sat down, and he taught the people from the boat. Everyone gathered in. They got close to the seashore. They weren't worried about props and propellers or anything like that. And they all gather in, and Jesus starts to teach. Here's the first step of Peter's journey. He heard the gospel. Now, I don't think he heard the gospel for the first time at this moment on the seashore. I think everything that Jesus said in Luke chapters 1 through 5, but the beginning of his ministry was the gospel. It was always the same message. It's why I tell you, church, I actually preach the same sermon every single Sunday. Different texts, different ideas, but it's really the same idea. Trust God, treasure God, stop settling for less. This sermon today is no unique than any other one. Jesus is preaching the gospel. He's teaching the word. Now, I have to ask myself the question, especially when I go back here, hear the word, and he taught. Luke doesn't actually tell us what Jesus taught. He just says he taught the gospel. Luke doesn't tell us the words that Jesus said. I think part of this is typically, if we were preaching this as a church, we, well, Luke chapter 5 would take us what? Seven, eight months? Okay? So Luke is assuming that we've been reading the letter. He wrote to Theophilus. Theophilus is reading the letter. The gospel was very clear in Nazareth, which is back in chapter 4. Here's what Jesus did in Nazareth. He said this. He's sitting in the synagogue in Nazareth, his hometown, and he gets the scroll from the attendant, and he reads from Isaiah. This is the quote. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, He's able to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set liberty to those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He's just reading the scroll from Isaiah. That's all Jesus is doing right now. He's reading this scroll, and then this is what happens. And he rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down, and all the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. Because when Jesus taught, it was different. When he read the scriptures, it was different than when anyone else read the scriptures. And Jesus says, yeah, here's why. He began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He's quoting Isaiah and the scroll, and here's what he tells people. Here's the gospel. I'm the one you've been waiting for. Here's the good news. Because here's the reality. We need Jesus. These people were praying for the Messiah. And now he shows up and he says, I am here. And here's what I'm here for. This is why I've arrived. I've arrived to give good news to the poor. Now, who is the poor that Jesus is talking about? This is that scary part after a year and a half of planting a church where you're really wondering, have we made progress? (laughs) Who is the poor? Everybody. Now, only half of us said that. I'm okay with that. We're all in process. Because I think there's moments in our life in El Dorado Hills and in Sacramento, we live in California. Do we have it good? Politics aside, people. (laughs) Do we have it good? So good. And Jesus says this message to a lot of people that are going to miss it because they have it good. Because when they hear the word poor, they're like, well, Jesus didn't come for me. Have you seen my boat? (laughs) Have you seen my car? I'll tell you about it because I share the things I care about. He says, I've come to give good news to the poor. The good news is simply this. You don't have to be poor anymore. You can be rich in me. This is the good news. He goes to those who are captives and he gives them liberty. Now, who are the captives that Jesus is talking about? Okay, we did half, 50% on round one. Let's try round two. Who are the captives? Okay, we got a 66%. We're making progress, church. But here's the reality. In California, we don't necessarily think we're captives. I think in Nazareth, we don't think we're captives. I'm not, I'm not in bondage. You are. We all are. We're in bondage to, to the paycheck. We're in bondage to relationships. We're in bondage to our kids. What are the things that force us to do what we do and why we do them? It's fascinating. I met a guy that was serving at base camp this week. He said, this is, this is vacation for me. In the past, he would say he's been in bondage to pursuing things that aren't going to bring him as much joy. But you know where his joy was this week? It was wearing a blue shirt serving at base camp. He's been set free from the captivity of pursuing the world and money and success. 
Jesus says, I've come to set you free from those expectations that you have on yourself that no one ever put on you other than the world that I didn't put on you. This is the gospel. This is the gospel that we are captive to our own reality that we've put ourselves on the throne of our life. That we've made joy a God in and of itself, and then we've settled for lesser joys. That's what we're captives to, which is why he then goes and he says this. He has actually sent me to recover the sight to the blind. You've been frustrated with someone because they just don't get it. Remind yourself that you were that someone far too recently. If you're blind, can you see? No, that's not a trick question. No. So he says, I've come to give sight to the blind. And guys, here's the reality. I've confessed this to you before as a pastor. I've been blind before. I've been in the church my entire life, and I've been blinded to what the gospel really was. See, part of my blindness in the church was simply this. I was convinced that to follow Jesus, I had to give up all of my pursuit of joy. And then what I realized is that I was actually settling for lesser joys. Jesus never asked me to abandon my pursuit of joy. He asked me to not settle for less. In fact, he gave me my desire, my pursuit of joy, so that I might find it in him and realize that it's not going to make me happy to have more stuff or to have a better this or a better that. None of that will make me happy. That's the gospel. We are poor, we are captive, and we are blind. And then what do we say happens, church? But God. That's the gospel. The gospel is apart from God. I was dead. I had nothing. And here's the reality. We live in California and we think that we're good. I have everything. And that's one way I think that Satan allows us to, to, to get a foothold into our lives. We think we're good. We don't define ourselves as poor, captives, or blind. Because we're blinded to that. And most of my friends that are blind, they just simply say this. They just give up to the reality that there's nothing more. So they settle for the little wins in life. They call it Hawaii. They call it the new boat, the new kitchen, the better grades for my kids, the promotion, the this, the this. And I think they just settle into a rhythm and a routine that says this is all there is. So we're going to take what we can get, and here's the gospel. Jesus says, no, there's so much more. There's so much more. And how do we know it's not good enough? Because then when we lose the job, we're like, oh, no, what are we going to do? And God's desire for us is that we would press into our theology and our thinking and say, there's got to be something more than what we're settling for. So Jesus preaches this gospel, and he says, I am that something more. We're going to talk this fall about our stories, and our stories recognizing that we were blind, that we were captives, that we were poor. But it's all about the story of Jesus, that he is the one that came to set the captive free. That I have life because he gave it to me. So I think that Peter heard the gospel. I think he heard it in the synagogue. I think he heard it at his mother-in-law's house. Not only did he hear it, he experienced it. He saw it. He was confronted with Jesus for who he really was. And what did Peter say to Jesus? Wow. Now, he still doesn't get it completely because he just calls him master. He's not Lord yet in this journey. But at some point, we have to hear the gospel. We have to hear it preached. And we have to be confronted with who Jesus is and who he says that he is. Jesus says, I am he. I am the one that we've all been waiting for, and I'm here for God's glory and for your good to recognize that in me. Here's what the text says. And when he finished speaking and preaching, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. And Simon answered, master. Now notice, I think that's an important word. I think Simon says it for a reason. I think that Luke records it for a reason. He says, master. He says, master, I know you're a great teacher. I know you've healed my mother-in-law. The jury's still out if I'd like that or not. He says, Master, we toiled all night and we took nothing. Now, I think here's what Peter says. Peter simply says this, hey, Jesus, you were just at my house. You know that mantle that had all those fishing trophies? Whose name was on that? Was it Jesus? No, it was Peter. You ever had that conversation with Jesus before? You liar, you have too. You know where you think that your better is better than his better? Here's what Peter says. He says, Master, we toiled all night. We took nothing, but at your word, I guess I'll do it. I'm smart enough not to say that you're an idiot, but I want to be perfectly clear, Jesus, that I'm not one. There's no fish today. There's nothing out there. And Jesus confronts Peter at the very thing that Peter's not ready to be confronted with or at, the source of his arrogance the source of his self-righteousness, 
I talked to a guy who recently lost his job. He says, now I can't provide for my family. I'm like, you never could before either. That wasn't about him. That was about God's design in our life that we start to recognize the provision isn't about the job. It's about trusting Christ. Here's what he says. He says, okay, Jesus, I'll do it. But my trophies are significant. Everybody knows that I'm a world-class fisherman. And when they had done this, when they followed Jesus faithfully, they put down their nets and they enclosed, what, what is that number? A large. I don't know how big. We're going to see more of description in a second. And their nets were breaking. Now, is this every fisherman's dream? Now, I don't fish, so I don't know. I like to eat fish. I don't like to work for anything, to be honest. And their nets are breaking, so they signal to their partners in the other boat, come help us. And they come, and they fill both boats so that they began to, how cool is that? Is Jesus trying to get somebody's attention? Does that ever happen in your life too? Where Jesus is like, you are so dumb. Let me go so extreme that you can't help but notice my godness. The boats are sinking. I don't know what's going on in Peter's mind at this point, but he is confronted with Jesus. He starts to see Jesus for who he is, and he sees him for who he is, and I think he experiences it as inadequacy. Now, how many of us like to experience our inadequacies? Let me see, uh, uh, raise a hand. How many of you guys like failure? No, in fact, we live our lives to pursue the avoidance of that reality, right? I tell people all the time, I don't play games I can't win. That's why I don't play soccer anymore. That's why I do CrossFit instead of CrossFit. Because I'm confident I will beat you at that game. Here's what Peter experiences. He experiences inadequacy. He says, I thought I was the best fisherman around. I thought I had all the trophies. I thought I had all figured out. But here's the reality. When I see Jesus, I start to see a different picture of perfection than what I thought I had. See, I've told you guys, I'm a Pharisee. A Pharisee was a religious person. I'm a recovering Pharisee. It's kind of like when we see Jesus, you know when you have a window on a cloudy day, you really don't see any of the smears or the marks in the window because it's cloudy and it's overcast. And then the sun comes out the next day, and then what do you see on that window? All the fingerprints? I feel like that's what's happening for Peter's life right now. Peter's like, you're the master, I get it, but man, I got my life really well put together. And Peter is confronted with Jesus. He's experiencing an addict's see in the boat. And he says this, but when Simon Peter saw this, when he saw Jesus for who he was, he falls down at Jesus' knees. He recognizes that he doesn't have his life put together. All the things that we strive to portray in the American culture that I'm a really good dad, that I can provide for my family, that my kids aren't as crazy as yours. All these things that we determine success, in Peter's mind they were different, but he starts to realize that his definition of success compared to true perfection doesn't come close. He starts to recognize that he's poor, that he's a captive, and that he's blind. From there, I think he attempts to withdraw from Jesus. Maybe you've been here before. You start to really deal with your sin and you recognize your sin. The way we define sin at Vintage Grace is simply this. Settling for less and giving anything more value or worth than God deemed it to have. So idolatry happens for me occasionally with my children, with my wife, with my church, with my church venue. No, not, not, that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but sin happens all the time. It creeps into my life, and I settle for lesser joys, and it can look like pornography, it can look like adultery, it can look like cheating or lying or stealing, but really what it is is it's not trusting God. That's what sin is. It's not treasuring him the way he deserves to be treasured. But when we start to realize that we don't measure up, I think there's this innate part of us that withdraws, that we step away from situations and scenarios where we're not going to win. We start to say, I don't want to be around that. I think that not only happens in Peter's day and in Peter's life, but it happens in the church. What if people really knew how sinful I was? I've told our elders in the past, if you guys knew how sinful that I was, you'd never let me preach. Ever. Ever. Pastor is a fancy definition for sinner saved by grace. It sounds a lot like Desi or Todd or Kathy or Drew. But when we experience our sin, we experience the reality that we are failures. We are. 
that we blow in it, and we don't need a DUI or an affair to prove it. We don't even have to go that far to realize that I don't measure up to the standard and the call that God has for my life, and I think the natural tendency is to withdraw. These are the things in our life that our wives and our husbands don't know, that our best buddy doesn't know, that we haven't told anybody, because if we did, they might not want to know us later. So we withdraw. We push away. We might not have acted on it, so we feel good about that, which is success on some level, but it's not even close. And we withdraw from Jesus. And so when Simon Peter falls to his knees, he recognizes this dissonance between him and not just his master, but look at this quote, depart from me, he says, for I'm a sinful man. Read those words with me. Oh, Lord, depart from me. Get away from me. So I've seen my friends, they kind of drift away. They don't want to be around Jesus. They don't want to be around people that remind them of Jesus because they see their sin, because they see the reality of their garbage and of their junk, and they say, I- I- I'm not worthy. I don't deserve to be loved. I can't be a part of Vintage Grace because I'm not good enough. You ever felt that way? Felt like I don't belong? Felt like I'm not lovable? Watch what Jesus does here. Here's what Jesus says to Peter in this moment. He says, do not be afraid. Peter understands that because of his sin, he deserves no rightful calling to be around Jesus ever. But he goes to Peter and he says, don't be afraid. Now, notice, does he tell Peter that any of Peter's thinking right now is incorrect? He didn't tell Peter, no, you're good. Here's a participation award. Does he do that for Peter? No, think about these steps. Peter's heard the gospel. He's confronted with Jesus. He experienced inadequacy. He withdraws from Jesus, and here's what Jesus does. He invites Peter to himself. He doesn't say, no, Peter, you're not that bad. He says, don't be afraid. Peter, I already knew that you were a scumbag. (laughs) That's not news to me. I'm God. I already knew all those deep, dark secrets. It's why I've come to you to set you free as a captive and to show you that you were blind because half of the time that we were sinning and settling for less, we didn't even know. That's what I keep telling Jeff Gomez and my Dodger fans. You just don't know that you're settling for less. And Jesus comes alongside Peter and he doesn't say, ah, it's okay, sin's not a big deal. No, it's a huge deal. I'm gonna go die on a cross because of it. I'm going to resurrect three days later to conquer your sin. It's a huge deal. But here's what Jesus does do. He comes and he says, Peter, you don't have to withdraw from me. Come back to me. He's invited to Jesus by Jesus, and he says, don't be afraid, because I came for your purpose. I came not just to get you the things that you couldn't reach. I came to show you the answer to the things that you don't even have questions for yet, which is how to have eternal joy. So Jesus comes and he says this, I love you where you are. And this is true for all of us this morning. If you're a guest this morning, if you've been a part of Indus Grace, you probably know this, at least have heard it. But if you're a guest, here's what Jesus says to Peter. I love you where you are, as you are, and how you are. But I love you so much that I will never leave you where you are. I'm not going to leave you in your sin. I'm not going to leave you settling for less. I'm going to love you to the point where you're going to have your life changed like the mother-in-law. Here's what the story goes on. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will have a new passion. You're going to be catching men. Jesus goes to Peter and he says this, I'm not just going to save you from your sin and from hell. I'm going to save you for a purpose. I'm going to give you a passion with a new purpose. I think that's that sixth step in salvation on one level. And these aren't supposed to be steps of salvation. I think this is just an observation from Peter's life. He's promised this new passion. Now, I don't know what you're passionate about. I am not passionate about catching fish. I don't care at all. I don't go fishing. But here's what Jesus does to Peter. He takes his life and he says, you thought you were supposed to be catching fish. Your life is so much bigger than this. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. I'm going to promise you a new passion, new affections, new love, new language, new understanding of who I am that you don't even begin to understand right now. And he promises Peter this new passion. So whatever it is that you're excited about, we talked about this last week for Evangelism Church. We share what we care about. All Peter's hearing right now from Jesus is not when they have fish questions of how to fish and how to tie their nets. They're not going to go to Peter. It's when they have Jesus questions, they're going to go to Peter. He's got a new passion and a new heart. And then we see the last verse, which I think might be the most important. 
Because faith without works is what, church? Dead. James is very clear with that. Here's part of the works. Here's what Luke says. And when they had brought their boats to land, they're sinking boats. I don't know if there's any fish left or if they've all swam out now. I don't know what's going on. They brought their boats to land and they left everything and followed him. True faith requires true action. We say this all the time. Good works will never bring you salvation, but salvation will always bring you good works. My hope and desire is anyone with a blue shirt or a green shirt, you didn't do that because you should or because you ought to this week. You did it because it brought you joy. Talk to my buddy Ed. Drew, I've had so much fun this week. That's it. Because it brings us joy, and God is glorified when we find more joy in him than in anything or anyone else. So when they bring their boats back to land, they leave everything and they follow him. Now I have to confess, church, when I used to read this verse, here's how I used to read it. And maybe you used to read it like this also. They bring back their boats, and they go through this process of hearing the gospel, confronted with Jesus, experienced inadequacy, withdrawing, invited, new passion, happily follow Jesus. That's not how I used to read it. I used to read salvation like, okay, I'm going to leave everything and follow Jesus. Because Jesus wants everything, right? He wants your heart. So I used to read this verse, I used to preach this verse, and this is how I read it. I'd be reading through in my little small font, and then they left everything. And here's the most common question I get from pre-believers. We've heard it from saints in our church. What must I give up to follow Jesus? And it's the wrong question. Because now I read this verse, and I read it this way, and they brought their boats to land, and they left everything and followed him. The question isn't what must I give up, it's what must I gain? Who am I pursuing? What am I after? Now, do we give up things when we follow Jesus? Absolutely. Absolutely, but what we understand is we haven't lost anything. We've gained everything. That's the trade. We talked about the train tracks last week at church and the reality of the trains coming Jesus made the most ludicrous exchange ever when he came to this world and took my sin and my rubbish and my garbage and he played himself on the tracks of my spiritual life and he took the train for me so that I didn't have to. That's the gospel. Setting the captive free, giving sight to the blind. So here's our journey with Jesus, church. Do we get this? And if we're not happily following Jesus, then do we not understand what's been exchanged for us so that we might have life? I really see this as three primary implications that I don't want us to miss this morning. The first one is this, just don't miss it. Now, I can't help you not miss it. That's a Holy Spirit thing. That's a timing thing where he is pursuing you. We'll never forget, and I've shared this story with our launch team in times past, but I used to teach at a school called Biola University. And I had this student that came in, and he was an exchange student. He's from Africa. And he came in, and, and he was very determined to pass my class. He came in, had a meeting with my office. He said, Drew, I want to pass your class. I said, cool, keep that bar low. We don't want A's. We just want C's or D's. D's earned degrees. That was the phrase. I just want to pass, Drew. I've heard your class is hard. How do I do that? And we walked through every single point of his exegesis paper. It, it was a class on how to read the Bible. We walk through every single point. Here's the text I'm going to give you. Here's what you write. Here's how you write about it. And at the end, if you do all these steps, you will pass. I don't think my classes were very hard. So Bom Coley, I'm so excited. I get his first paper and he turns it in and I'm so excited because I know Bom Coley is working hard on this paper. We've met together. We've spent time in the library together finding sources and we get through the whole paper and he turns it in and I'm so excited to sit down. I got my cup of coffee. It's Friday night because I'm a nerd and that's what I do Friday nights. I grade papers. And I'm writing through the paper, and it was so fun to grade. I'm like, great big idea. Good exegesis, good author's intent. And I keep marking up this paper with all these good, 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 good. And I get to the end of the paper, and here's what I had to write at the bottom. What kind of grade do you think I gave him? He got an F. And I just had to write the most painful note I've ever written for a student before in my entire life. You wrote on the wrong passage. It was like depressing. Guys, you understand, if we're writing on the wrong passage metaphorically, as far as what Jesus is really after, we could miss the whole thing. Jesus isn't after you looking a certain way. He isn't after you doing certain things for him. He's not after any of the externals at all. Remember who misses it? It's the Pharisees. It's the religious people. Who gets it is the mother-in-law who understands that Jesus is after my heart. 
Jesus wants your heart. Don't miss that, church. D don't miss. It's not about doing the right things. Salvation comes by faith and by grace alone. Good works flow from faith. That's all they do. May we be a church that believes that. The second one is if we do, then we trust and we treasure Jesus. We trust that his better is better. We have moments in those lives where, where we, Jesus says, I want you to do this. Do we trust that his better is better? Are we ready to say, you know what? I don't like kids. But if you want me to serve at base camp, let's do this, Jesus. I trust you. My neighbor, he doesn't deserve your grace. And then we hear Jesus' voice. He says, yeah, but neither did you. That person, God, that's so far from you, they're not holy. And Jesus reminds us, yeah, neither were you. That's why you treasure me is because you understand that you did nothing to earn or deserve your salvation. It was a free gift from God. Anyone here need to trust Jesus more today than they did yesterday? You don't need to treasure Jesus more than they do the stuff of this world. Father God, I pray for our people that we would do that. And the third implication is then simply this. We just journey with each other and with Jesus in that pursuit. Father God, help us. I look at these implications for today, God, and I do believe that the road is narrow, and I do believe that we often miss it, and I do believe that I was blind until you gave me sight. We don't ever want to go back. We want to fight for our joy as a church. We want our kids to see the joy of you in us so that as they grow in their relationship, as they grow in life, they see you because they see you in us. Father God, I pray specifically that we can reconcile the scandal of grace. I pray that we can deal with the reality of the fact that I am nothing apart from you but God. But you see me in my worthless rags and you invite me to you and you give me grace. And it is scandalous. It did cost something. So Father, I pray for the people in this room right now that they don't know who you are yet, but they're starting to see it in their neighbors and in their friends. And I pray that they would hear your voice this morning simply saying this, I love you as you are, where you are, enough to send my son to die for you. And as scandalous that is, that grace, it's also love. So Father, may we see your love today. May we experience it in a new way. May we identify where we're at in the journey. And may many of us take time to reflect and say, you know, Jesus, we're not really happily following you. So Jesus, I repent for that. And I ask this morning, you meet me where I'm at, and I say, give me hope, give me life, give me a vision for what it looks like to joyfully journey with you so that you might be glorified and so my joy might be complete in you.